Good day. My name is Basil Van Haaf, and together with Francis Sargwal from Uganda, we're co-chairing the development of a global biodiversity framework under the Convention on Biological Diversity. You've asked me to talk about the linkage between agroecology and conservation. And I have prepared a present, a short presentation, and I will share my screen now so you can get to see that. You should now see my screen. So I will talk to you about the context where the convention is coming, where the framework is coming within that convention, and then we'll drill down to the importance of the agri-food production system, both in terms of, of uh, a producer, but also in terms of an impact on conservation. And then we'll drill down in the GBF and what you can do. So without further ado, let's go into the, the context part. The Convention on Biological Diversity has three objectives, and, and you're probably clearly interested in the balance with, within by two of those objectives, the conservation side, which is about protecting biodiversity, but also this, the use of biodiversity in terms of a production tool for food, fiber, and shelter, etc. Within that, the, the convention works with decadal framework, and we're now in the process of negotiating the framework to 2030. We were given by the parties a number of principles, and some of which are really relevant to the discussion here, particularly the notion that we have to have ambitious targets and goals, those that will be enabling to reach our vision, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but also realistic one, both in terms of being possible to attain and also taking into consideration externalities like population growth, the changing needs of people, and international trade. So clearly uh, that is complex, but that is totally doable. But let's look and drill down now to uh, the relationship between agri-food production and biodiversity. At the macro level, uh, we're told that two thirds of the global economy depend on biological process of one kind or another. And, and the largest part of that is the agri-food uh, production business. On the other end, uh, biodiversity is impacted by agriculture, agricultural production. And we're seeing some uh, trends in terms of the impact on soil health, the impact on pollination uh, services. And that is coming from land conver conversion, pesticides and nutrients. So it is a dual relationship where there is a benefit on biodiversity, but at the same time, there is an impact that can be negative and positive. So, Looking at uh, the agri-food uh, system as a, as a priority, um, what we knew at the macro level when we look at the GBS as a whole is that if we are to implement the change we want and get to the vision, there is a significant change that needs to take place in many aspects of our social product, uh, fabric. Particularly, uh, several organizations have identified that change in the agri-food system will be probably one of the most important change, both in terms of their contribution to biodiversity, but also in the magnitude of the change that we're talking about. This is why we're so interested in talking to you today. Now, we're not working on our own here, and, and there is a, a number of various agreement and negotiation taking place that are working together. At COP26 on the climate change side last year in Glasgow, there was very significant contribution made to the biodiversity agenda by conserving, protecting land, by also committing to phasing out negative subsidy on oil and gas. Further, at the UNEA uh, Conference 5, there was this agreement to have a plastic agreement, uh, which is about addressing one of the major causes of pollution impacting biodiversity. Further, at the World Trade Organization, a little bit later, there was this momentous uh, agreement on phasing out negative uh, subsidies and incentive on the fishery side. We have That's where we are now. We will be moving to uh, COP27 on climate. And I know there is a full day dedicated to biodiversity, so really looking forward to what is being done. And then Further down, there will be our COP and, and what will be the contribution of biodiversity to the global agenda? Could this be around agriculture transformation? 
Could it be around the phasing out of negative subsidies, including for agriculture? Is that going to be an addition to what is already on the table? So all that is, is question. But now let's focus on the global biodiversity framework it, itself and understand how it is contributing to this uh, game. So on the, on the very left, you see a number of uh, gray box with color ones, which is the assessment coming from our scientific organization, the International Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. That assessment, I recognize five causes of biodiversity decline, land and sea use change, overexploitation, the impact of climate change, pollution, and invasive alien species. All that is also done in the context of a number of indirect drivers, demographic, economic and technological institution, governance, conflicts, values, and behavior. That is leading us to a, a current state where we, we are seeing our ecosystem being, being damaged. We're seeing species and genetic diversity being lost and human well-being being put at risk. Where we want to be is on the right side, that white box on vision of living in harmony with nature. What we're negotiating within the CBD is what is within this red cycle, the global biodiversity framework, starting with expressing the vision as goals that can be measured. So we know where we are, we know where we're making subject. Those goals will move if action are taken. And you can see on the screen here, 21 action grouped around four tree teams. One is around addressing the direct threat to biodiversity. Another one is around meeting people need. And there is a bunch of actions that we call tools and solutions that are supporting mechanism. All that is done within the context of a new robust planning and reporting and review system that will enable us not only to know if the action are taken, but also if we're getting the effect we need on, uh, on the goals and targets. There will also be a number of means of implementation, including resources, but also guidance on cross-cutting issues like right-based approach, the place of indigenous people and local communities, engagement of women and girls, etc. So you can see that the, the GBF is situated within a wider context. It is contributing to the, the CBD vision, but it also is contributing to a number of other elements indirectly. Now let's, let's drill down on a limited number of targets that are more directly related to uh, the agri-food production system. The first group is target one, two, and three uh, that address uh, the uh, land and sea use change. Target one is that notion that you have to plan your whole landscape. It is not just about uh, taking care of protected area. It is all about how we manage the, the whole landscape and ensure that we have positioning in the right place, productive activities uh, and, and activities that would have a significant impact on biodiversity. It is also about uh, protecting wild area and, and, and making sure that uh, we're not overusing those. Then second, there is a very important of, uh, activity of restoration. And there, there will be a lot of discussion because there is at this point various interpretation of uh, the starting point of restoration activities and the endpoints. Are we talking about restoring to a full natural system that could be desirable in some instances? Or are we talking about restoring to a point where there is a certain a number of biodiversity service available and perhaps uh, productive activities at the same time on the same landscape. Tree is the famous 30 by 30 proposal uh, for protection and conservation, keeping in mind that uh, conservation is an activity uh, that could uh, include some productive activity at the same time if there is a direct biodiversity outcome. Seven is around pollution, and we've talked about plastic, so uh, definitely an area that is uh, more or less taken care of from a process perspective. What we're left to is how we're going to be addressing uh, the negative impact of uh, pesticides and nutrients that are um, left in the environment. Uh, we're careful when uh, we talk about that to talk about not a necessarily an overall reduction of uh, the use, uh, because that would be outside of our purview but a reduction of the negative impact of what is released to the environment. 
14, 15, and 16 are important targets around decision that uh, various entities are making and how biodiversity is, is factored into those decision, decision. That's what we call mainstreaming in our jargon. Uh, 14 is around the action and role of government in policies, regulation, planning, uh, impact assessment, and particularly in ensuring that financial flow are aligned with biodiversity values. 15 is around the role of business at all scale and, and how uh, they will understand and report on the dependencies on one side on biodiversity, but also their impact and a reduction of the negative impact. This is all about uh, addressing various part of the of the economy, and and really looking at uh, at supply chain use and disposal. So that notion of circularity. Sixteen. At the end of the day, this is about us, each of us, uh, individual choice, and making sure that people have access to sustainable choice and have the information to make the right decision about food. Etc. And, and we're addressing overconsumption at the same time. And then finally, we wanted to stop on, on target 18, which is around uh, negative incentive and subsidies and, and uh, the notion of stopping them and if possible, repurposing them. And, and uh, ass um, assessments are that there is a vast amount of negative subsidies and incentive. And, and just by stopping that, you remove a cost on the, on the side of, uh, of the equation. So it is not necessarily providing new resources in the resource mobilization equation, but it, it is in fact uh, reducing the cost side. So a very important uh, target. Now, switching to the, the, the role of agriculture and food system, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, this is something that has uh, 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 acquired a lot of attention by, by many. Um, it is important to note that uh, uh, while it is present in the framework in many places, as explained a little bit earlier, there is not a single target on agriculture. We felt there would be kind of uh, diminishing the, the the values and I think parties have agreed with us, but perhaps we we need to have a way to capture the agricultural perspective on the framework in a companion document. Definitely, the implementation of the framework will will uh, will rely on uh, on the action agriculture, but also make a contribution to many aspects of the sustainable development agenda. Uh, obviously, in terms of uh, poverty, hunger, inequality access to clean water, uh, sustainability, and resource consumptions. So um, the, the efforts and resource that would be directed to make the change will be of interest and benefit to the agriculture community as well. Now let's talk about the, the barrier and particularly as they relate to agroecology. Uh, I think the number one barrier is an understanding of what it means. There is, there is a growing uh, cadre of people understand that, but we can see in the uh, in our negotiation that uh, it is not uh, wide and deep enough, and and we're going to need to do some work. And then second, the regulatory environment, ensuring that uh, not only that we remove the negative incentive, but also that we enable and promote agroecology. A quick word on the on the process. Uh, you will see on the screen a, a very long timeline. What was initially seen as a two-year process is has ended up being a four-year process because of COVID. We have resumed face-to-face -face negotiation in February in Geneva, and we had a second session in Nairobi in June. We're now looking at uh, uh, a, a final negotiation session immediately ahead of the COP in Montreal in December. But in between, we will have, and you see that's this uh, light blue or aqua box, a, a, a process by which we want to simplify the debt. Uh, you know, we recognize that the current text is full of brackets and is not in the stage where we can bring it to ministers successfully. But uh, I'm confident with the process we have that we'll be able to put in front of ministers in December in Montreal, a text that that will have brackets around around key issues that they're going to have to deal with, but a limited number of those, and in a way that will get us to a a, um, a positive outcome. Um, your contribution and engagement, uh, uh, we we uh, you should be engaging at several level. 
primarily speak to your country delegation. Go speak to your government and explain what you can do in terms of uh, contribution and what you need to make that contribution. Uh, speak to your communities, engage in your communities. That's going to be very important as well. Uh, and explain and, and hopefully I'll give you some, some uh, information you can share. Be vocal about your support, your views and contribution. And engage and, and uh, unite with like-minded organizations. Have a presence at the COP. That's going to be very, very useful. This uh, complete my presentation, and I could not resist but give you a picture of uh, what uh, agroecology is doing in my garden and my family table in terms of production. This is the time of the year, and, and we have many more than that since I took that picture. Thank you very much.